to see a little bit of review, and then we're going to go on and talk about climate modeling and why you'd want to do that. Uh, so just review of energy balance and then look at carbon dioxide. And you've seen some of this in other talks today, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, here's our friend, the, the energy balance equation, where we looked at the energy coming in and the energy going out. And where before I talked mostly about the energy that's coming in, about solar radiation, about the impact of volcanoes, and so on. This time I'm going to concentrate more on the right-hand side, the energy that's going out, um, which is related to the composition of the atmosphere. So if we look at the climate of the last 100 years, this is for New York Divi Climate Division 10, which I think is this climate division. Uh, you can see that the annual average temperature has gone through periods of um, so maybe slow increases, some decreases over time, and then since about 1970 or so, a more rapid increase. And that rapid increase since 1970 is very similar to what's going on globally. And so there have been time periods like that. If you looked at the same graph for Georgia, you'd actually see the slope going down. In other words, in Georgia over the last 100 years, it's getting colder. If you, and if you say that a positive slope or a slope upward is, is identified by a red dot here, a slope going down would be identified by a blue dot. You can see, if you can see this tiny little inset graph here, that in the southeast we have a lot of blue dots. In other words, in the southeast we're actually gotten colder over the last 100 years. And part of that makes my job very hard because when I talk to people, they say, well, the, the climate hasn't changed here in the last 100 years, um, and so why should we believe in, in global warming? Of course, you know, you, you can never say just whatever's happening at one spot is necessarily representative of what's happening anywhere else. But it, is, it makes talking in the southeast maybe a little bit tougher because they have not experienced warming the same way that you have here in the northeast, or they have really in most parts of the, of the country. And so it's, there could be a number of reasons for why this is increasing. Some people attribute this decrease from really about the 30s down to 1970 to increases in industrial pollution, which make the, the atmosphere less transparent. Now, there's also um, some evidence that there is an increase in small volcanic activity during that time. So that also may have increased the, um, have changed the albedo. And since that time, we've seen the temperature go up more. In, in Georgia, we think at least part of the reason it's been negative is changes in land use. 100 years ago, we had a lot more open fields they grew a lot more cotton. Of course, cotton has a lot of bare dirt with it. And after the boll weevil came into the southeast, a lot of that cotton production moved out of the southeast. And forests now cover more than 70% of Georgia. Forests generally are cooler. And so we think at least part of that is human-induced land change, land use changes over time. If you look at the relationship between temperature, precipitation, and drought, this is, this is the same graph where temperature just kind of squished down. So you can see this period, not a lot of change, maybe some cooling here, and then warmer temperatures. This is the same graph for the same part of the state. And you can see the increase in precipitation that's happened later in the record. And Art talked about this a little bit this morning in his talk. Um, you also see this is a representation of the Palmer Drought Severity Index, so it's a measure of drought in this part of the state. Early in the record, the drought happened a lot more frequently. If you talk to some of the farmers who've been farming for a long time or had family farms and they've talked to their grandparents, it was quite different back in those days. It was a lot drier. Um, now, we very seldom had long droughts that have, that have lasted. So this increase in precipitation has really led to a, a decrease in drought, at least in the short time period. Now, if temperature continues to go up, as we expect it will, then we're going to start to see more impacts of increased evaporation and evapotranspiration. And we're not sure what's going to happen with the precipitation. It might still continue to go up, it might go up in some seasons, um, but that's something that would have to be considered. You've seen this graph. This is, this is the graph of carbon dioxide going up over time. You can actually, if you want, kind of break it down into where the carbon dioxide is coming from. We know a lot of it's coming from transportation. Uh, some of it from energy production, and then a smaller amount from, from agriculture and other things like that. Um, one of the nice things about modeling is it allows you to separate that out. Other gases that were mentioned earlier, methane and nitrous oxide. <coughs> you can see also, if you look at uh, zero um, AD to the present, 
They've been relatively stable for a lot of that time period, and then since about the 1700s, all of them have taken a very rapid increase over time. Um, and you have to really go back really to the ice ages to see similar kinds of patterns, or, or sometimes two million years or more, if you're going to find patterns that have similar amounts of carbon dioxide. Of course, you no know, humans were living then, so that's something to consider. We know that if we look on the long term, on the ice age, you know, tens of thousands of years scale, carbon dioxide and temperature increase together. You can see that in the lower graph here, the temperatures in red, the carbon dioxide in green, and they, they vary very closely together. So one of the questions has been kind of a chicken or egg question. Is the temperature changing the carbon dioxide, or is the carbon dioxide changing the temperature? <coughs> and that hasn't been a very good question, although I think lately uh, the more recent studies have shown that the temperature is leading the carbon dioxide. And so as the temperature goes up, the carbon dioxide might go up. But they're linked so closely together that it's hard to, it's hard to show exactly what's going on. One of the things we do know is that if you compare solar radiation, which is the curve down here, here's the temperature, uh, here's the carbon dioxide, we do know that solar radiation has not been increasing as much. And so one of the arguments that some deniers will say is, well, you know, we're just seeing a more active sun. But that really doesn't show up in the data. The sun is not really more active. And so uh, when you try to separate that out, it's clear that the solar activity is not what's driving the temperature increases over time. <coughs> the reason that the atmospheric composition is important is because of something called the atmospheric window. There's actually two windows. One is the window where solar radiation comes in. You know, the window that we have here seems transparent, but really it only lets in certain wavelengths of light. And the atmosphere, uh, because of the kinds of gases that are in it, lets sunlight in, short, short wavelength light, very readily. But there's, there's gases that help prevent that, uh, things like ozone. Ozone's right here. Uh, ozone, and, and that's why ozone has been important in the past when we talk about things like um, you know, increase in cancer and so on, because the ozone helps control how much sunlight gets in. If you don't have enough ozone, then more sunlight gets in and you have more cancer-causing um, radiation that comes in. But for the other atmospheric window, the one that controls the energy that's leaving the Earth and going back out into space, then that's controlled by things like carbon dioxide and methane and so on. So here's the nitrous oxide, uh, here's carbon dioxide. And uh, so if you put all those together, there's just an area of a fairly short range of wavelengths that allows light from the Earth to go back up into space. As you add more carbon dioxide or more methane or so on, it kind of pinches off that window, which means it's hard for that radiation from Earth to get back to space. It gets trapped near the ground, and that really helps cause the temperature to go up. So the rest of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about how you predict the climate or project the climate in the future. You can just say, well, that whatever trend we have now is going to continue in the future. But I think you'll see that you know, in the, it might work for short periods, but it probably isn't going to work very well for long periods because there's a lot of things going on in the atmosphere. And it's really not just the atmosphere, but it's also the ocean and the land surfaces all acting together. So climatologists tend to use computer models, climate models, that help to simulate uh, future climate. And they, they do this based on equations like the one I showed, plus equations that describe the relationship between all those feedbacks. Uh, to try to predict what's going on. So there might be a trend here. You could predict the trend will continue, but if you factor in things like the changes in carbon dioxide, then you might get quite a different answer. Climate models, um, as I said, use basic equations and basic physics, but they have to simplify, just like any other model. So I, I really like the analogy this morning of the, the model of the maps and the directions. I thought that was great because you know, when I'm going to plan a trip, I usually go to three or four of those and look at the, the range of values that they put out for how long it's going to take. Um, and over time, I, I think I have learned that the Google one is closest to um, estimating my own driving speed. Um, but not, not all of them are equally good, but they all have to make assumptions about, you know, what the road conditions are going to be like, uh, how fast you're going to drive, and things like that. And so all those... Have their own. I have a GPS that I use when I drive around too. It, it never brings in the, the assumption of stoplights. 
So you always have to factor stoplights in. And if you're going to go a route that has more stoplights, then you know it's going to underestimate what's going on. And climate models, because all those feedbacks are going on at the same time, are way more complicated. Um, and as a result, and because computers have limited, limited amount of uh, space to do the calculations, they started out by doing something very simple called a box model, where you have one number going in, you have a few calculations, and then another number coming out, usually some sort of temperature. And then over time, they've added other models as well. So you can kind of see the evolution of the models over time. These have evolved as our knowledge has improved, but also because the computers are a lot better now. You know, the computers that they used to do the early models in the 70s are less powerful than what's in your cell phone now. And so it's, it's hard to imagine how much things have changed over time uh, and how, th how much things might change in the future as they get better. But they started out basically with temperature. They had sunlight coming in. They might have a little bit um, of rain or something like that. They did not have an ocean at all. Uh, of course, you know, three quarters of the Earth is covered by ocean, so it's a big assumption. And then over time, they added land surface. They added some ice in the form of putting in Greenland and putting in Antarctica. They added more rain. They've added uh, emissions from the Earth. They've added an ocean. Um, they usually started with what they call a swamp ocean, which means the water was there, but it just kind of sat there. And now they have oceans that have currents in, which can be a lot more realistic. They've added in chemistry things like how the ozone changes over time. And so they're a lot better than they were in the old days. And a lot of that has to do with a better understanding of how it all works, because you know, science is an ongoing thing, but also with better computers. Models all basically work on the same idea. You take the Earth, you slice it up into little cubes, and you keep track, and, and really, you have to keep track of everything in the climate system within each one of those cubes. And so you keep track of how much water versus land there is. Or sometimes in the earlier models, they just assigned one was either land or ocean. They didn't really talk about it as a fraction. You keep track of clouds. You keep track of the temperature inside, the amount of rainfall, and things like that. And then you also have to move stuff because, of course, the wind blows and blows temperatures and blows humidity and everything from one box to another. So you have to keep track of all that. So instead of just having a simple check you know, checkbook, like you would for your own bank account. It's like keeping track of a, a corporation where you've got multiple accounts and things are coming in and out. And all of those have to be taken into account when you do the, the climate modeling. As Art talked about earlier, that there's a lot of problems with the models, especially the early ones. They had really pretty gross um, and simplified uh, topography. They didn't really calculate, they didn't really show mountains very well. They didn't really show the outlines of the coast very well. You can see on this particular one, Florida turns out to be just two grid boxes, and it leaves out this whole part of the coast along Louisiana. Uh, same thing is true. It leaves out half of New Jersey. Um, maybe that's a good thing. But uh, <laughs> maybe not. Um, so, so it's very simplified. The, the Rocky Mountains show just sort of a basic hump where the mountains are, but it doesn't show anywhere near the detail. And if you've ever been in that part of the world, you know that that's tremendous detail, tremendous relief, and all those local climates are very important if, you, if you're the one that's got a, a farm out there that you're worried about. So this simplification is especially bad for things like rainfall. And the reason for that is rainfall is a very small scale process for the most part. You have thunderstorms um, that are acting. You have uh, topography that drives thunderstorms as well, uh, or other kinds of rain. So a lot of it happens in small scale um, things. And so you have to do something called downscaling, where you take this global climate model, and then you put another, another model within it, and you feed things back and forth. The, the, and the smaller model, we call that a nested grid model, um, has finer scale, so you can actually get better details as far as the mountains go, or the coastlines, or things like that. Uh, but there's a whole other process that you have to go through when you take information from the big model and put it into the small models. That's not really simple. And so there's, there's people that spend their lives that are looking at downscaling and what's the best way to do that. Uh, some of the other problems with um, the models that we've used in the past is they're not always very good at predicting the current climate. You know, it's, if, if you can't even get the current climate right, then that's a concern because you'd like them to be relatively realistic. And there's some reasons because of the simplifications that they do that. A lot of times they also don't have things like El Nino, 
the intraannual variability is not well captured, or things like hurricanes, again, because the hurricanes are relatively small scale. And in certain parts of the country and certain parts of the world, those are the primary drivers of climate, and so you really have to take the predictions of climate with a bigger grain of salt there where you can't do that. Well, Art used the, the male and female models. I like to use a little different analogy here, the sports car versus the truck. Um, and there's some things that are similar to both, right? I mean, they're both, they're both red. They both have internal combustion engines. They both drive about the same way, and yet they're designed to do really different things. Um, sports cars are like weather models. They're designed to do one thing really well. So if you want to go really fast, you're probably going to pick a sports car like this Ferrari. Um, I think it's a Ferrari. It might be. So, so you know, it will work pretty well for short periods of time. You might not want to do a cross-country trip in it. Oh, it might be fun. Um, but you probably would not want to plow your field with the Ferrari. Again, it might be fun. It probably wouldn't be real good for the Ferrari. Then there's a climate model, which might be more like the truck. Maybe not as much fun to drive, especially over short distances, but probably more useful in the long run for that particular thing. They're really designed to do different things. They work on some of the same basic physical principles, but they're really tuned to do one particular thing, better or worse. So the, the truck, the, the climate models are more looking at long-term average conditions, uh, seasonal to multi-year, um, and over bigger time scales, whereas the uh, Ferrari, the, the sports car weather model, is more like a, a short-term thing. They're trying to get all the details right in a real short period of time. The advantage to models is that they can separate things out. You can say, what if we just turn off this, what, we, we turn off any changes in the sun? How is that going to affect things? Um, or what if we put in a volcano? How is that going to affect? How is that going to affect something? What if we turn off the changes in methane? And you can actually break it down not only to methane in general, but you could, or carbon dioxide, but you could actually break it down and say, well, what if we change the way we drive and so that we're all driving electric vehicles and that changes the emission? How is that going to change things? The importance of that is that it allows us to figure out economically what makes the most sense. Because everything that you change has a cost. And, you know, there might be some good costs and some bad costs to it, but, but you can't change everything at once um, and get a good feeling for what's going to be the, the best in terms of cost-benefit ratio. So you can use the models to separate it out. And the models show, the, the pink here shows the predicted models if you include the effects of anthropogenic uh, changes like the carbon dioxide changes. Um, the blue shows what happens if you only include the natural effect like volcanoes and sunspots and so on. And you can see that the red line here um, the average temperature follows the, the predictions a lot more closely for um, the anthropogenic plus the natural than it does for just the natural variability. So that gives us some confidence that our models are actually picking up on the fact that humans are contributing to the changes in climate. And another thing we can do is scenario modeling, which is really what if modeling. What if uh, we do business as usual. And Art talked about this a little bit this morning, too. What if, what if nothing changes and we just act like nothing's going on? Um, so that would be one scenario. Or we could say, I think you've used the pie in the sky analogy. The pie in the sky. What if we completely changed our way of life so that all of a sudden, you know, we're emitting a lot less carbon? And so you can, you can actually go through and really look at a whole range of outcomes. And so that's another of the advantages is that it shows you the range of possibilities. Now, not all the models are very good. Uh, the models have been bad at predicting things like the changes in sea ice. This is the predictions that sea ice would go down over time. Um, you know, I think people give Al Gore a hard time because he was talking about the possibility of going down to zero um, within the next few years. And obviously, that didn't come true. But there is a range of predictability. And the observations for the sea ice show that it's going down a lot faster than we thought of it, than we expected it to. It has gone up just slightly in the last couple of years, um, still way below what was predicted. And so the models definitely aren't perfect. A lot of things have to do with not understanding how the deep ocean works and how ocean, because you know we don't have a lot of instruments in the ocean. So it's really hard to figure out what's going on. And, and the ocean is very deep. There's a lot of currents going on. Um, 
Things like that are not well understood yet. We look at projections of future temperature. Um, here's the observed temperature, and here's just two of the different scenarios. But so it kind of gives you a range of possibilities. In Georgia, when we looked at the uh, outcomes of different model predictions, we looked at about 80 different models in uh, predictions of, or projections of what the future climate would be like. In every one of those 80 models, the temperature went up over the, over the next 100 years. So that gives us a pretty high confidence that temperatures are going to be going up. Now, precipitation was much less so. Precipitation was a lot more variable and because of those things like the subgrid scale uh, problems that we need to deal with. So, so we do know, based on all these different models, temperatures are going to increase. And we're not sure, um, partly because of problems with the models, but also because we don't, we have to make a lot of assumptions about people's behavior. You know, if you think, if you think weather and climate are hard to predict, then you try to predict people. Uh, and the economy, it's, it's a very hard thing to do. As farmers, you know, you have to not only consider the climate, but you have to consider the market, the, the price of crops, the price of inputs like fertilizer and so on, um, the length of the growing season, whether you think you can get a crop in. So there's a lot of factors that fall in besides just climate. But um, for climate prediction in the future, we, we can see there's going to be a range, but we can't really factor in all the other things. We leave that to economists and other folks to try to look at. We do know there's going to be a longer growing season. We're seeing that already. Uh, we estimated in the southeast for about every one degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, the growing season increases by a week to 10 days. And so that might change the way you make decisions about what kind of crops you grow or if you try to double crop. Some of the projections. This, here's the historical climate, the number of days above 90. Uh, you can see that in the right-hand side, the projected change just based on one scenario shows a lot more warming, a lot more days above 90, especially along the coast, but I can see even near here uh, also some increases over time, which might be a problem if you have a crop that's sensitive to high temperatures or if you've got cattle that you're worried about heat stress. Projections depend on which scenario you're picking, and so there's a lot of variability based on that. Uh, not all the seasons are necessarily going to be the same. So as Art pointed out, the winter will probably get warmer a lot quicker than some of the other seasons because of some of the albedo feedbacks and other things we talked about. Um, and heat waves will also change. This is not only a problem for the animals, it's also problems for your labor out in the field because they have to work in the heat too. So if you have people that are outside, you have to be able to factor in the effects of heat waves on, on, on the labor as well as on the animals. There's a whole variety of projections here. I'm not going to go into that. Precipitation is a lot more iffy. Um, <coughs> this is just two models. The Canadian model shows the Northeast is going to get drier. The Hadley model, a different model, shows it's going to get wetter. It's very hard to make long-term predictions. We do know, based on the, the trends, that we're probably going to see these increases in the extreme precipitation over time. We're already seeing those trends occur, so we have a high degree of confidence that those are going to continue. And that's a problem for infrastructure, because infrastructure is all designed for a climate that doesn't change. And so that's an issue that is really going to have to be addressed. There's other impacts like sea level, which may not be a direct impact for most of you, but if you live in a state with a coast, then your state's going to have to deal with that, and that's going to affect your taxes uh, and regulations and things like that. Um, other impacts, things like changes in vegetation, that maple forest is probably going to be a thing of the past in the Northeast. Uh, no more Vermont maple syrup that will move up into Canada. So if you are like many farmers and you have multiple sources of income on your farm and you were, you were doing maple sugaring in the past, you might not be able to do that in the future. Um, all those things are tougher to predict but are certainly being looked at. Other things like diseases are also likely to change. Uh, people are going to be moving around because they're not going to be able to grow food in their own areas or there's going to be wars over water. So all those things will be important. And of course, finally, there's a lot of other things that we can't really predict. We can't predict solar output, although in the news lately they've talked about the coming, the coming little ice age of the next 20 years because they, some astrophysicists are predicting that we might have a quieter sun in 10 to 20 years or so. The effect of asteroids, um, changes in ocean circulation pattern, and of course, as I said, uh, human behavior. 
So I'm going to stop there so I get time for Stephen, but I'll take a couple of questions if you've got questions. <laughs>